to many of you. I oh, the meeting's being recorded. This is this is uh, important for all of us. Um, so welcome back to many of you, and welcome to those of you who have not been part of Cheese O'Clock in the past. Um, we, in many good ways, we took about a two-year break, <laughs> but that's because um, we all emerged into the world again after uh, after that terrible time in our history. And uh, but here we are enjoying cheese and wine, and um, not just any cheese and wine. And I don't want to forget to say that uh, that some of the proceeds from tonight are going to World Central Kitchen. And for anyone who is not familiar with that organization, you can find it at wck.org. It is a magnificent organization that um, is worth is worth knowing about. Uh, so. We are in for a really great night of cheese and wine pairing. I do say cheese and wine. I'm sure that Domaine Carneros calls it wine and cheese, but uh, whatever the case, we are in for it. And um, tonight we are, or I am joined by my uh, my colleague, my cheese colleague extraordinaire, Janet Fletcher, cheese maker extraordinaire, Kuba Hammerling, and wine uh, winery CEO extraordinaire, Remy Cohen from Domaine Carneros. And of course, Cuba is with Point Reyes Cheese. Uh, just one little thing about myself. I am the author of several books about cheese and I am a speaker in the corporate world as well as at food and wine events around the country. And I'm really happy to be on this virtual call, as I said, after a long time away. And um, I guess with that, I will turn it over to Janet. Thanks, Laura. I'm Janet Fletcher here with you from Napa Valley and uh, just really excited to be back. I think it's been a couple of years since we've had a cheese o'clock and we hadn't really thought about bringing it back, but then we had this great opportunity to partner with Point Reyes, one of our favorite California creameries and with uh, Domaine Carneras, which makes such splendid sparkling wine in that beautiful space that you can see behind Remy, one of the most beautiful places you can visit in Napa Valley. So just couldn't turn down this opportunity to have a holiday edition of Cheese O'Clock and help you get your holidays off to a great start. So I just want to remind you that um, we'd love for you to take advantage of the chat and you know keep the conversation going among yourselves. I think there are some people from Point Reyes and Domaine Carneris on the chat. So if you have questions you know, about like, where can I find this cheese, they can probably answer that in the chat. Um, but please put any other questions you have for Laura or me or our panelists um, in the Q&A, and we will have some time at the end to get to your questions. Also wanted to remind you that we would love it if you would take a picture of your uh, cheese board or your cheese party and um, post on social media. Please use our uh, hashtag cheese o'clock and tag Laura and me. I am uh, Janet Fletcher NV for Napa Valley. And Laura is um, cheese lady with a Z. So please uh, help us uh, keep the uh, conversation going about cheese o'clock on social media. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Laura to introduce our first guest. Okay. So uh, as Janet intimated, we could not do this without point raised cheese, and um, and I could not live without point raised cheeses. So there's that. But uh, so Cuba is the uh, man behind the magic at Point Reyes Cheese Company. Uh, he is uh, came to us by way of Poland, where he is from. And uh, and of course, that's where they make lots of cheeses. Actually, they, you prob they probably do. I just don't know what those are. But in any case, um, so Kuba, tell us just a little bit about yourself and then about the cheeses that we are tasting tonight. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you, Laura, Janet, uh, for having me here tonight. You know, I. Those two gals are my favorite California cheese writers. Um, so I was very privileged that you guys invited us to have this event tonight. Um, so um, yeah, like Laura mentioned, I came from Poland. I've been with Point Race Pharmacy since 2009. Um, I study food science uh, in Poland at the Agriculture University of Poznań, uh, where I graduated with engineering degree in food science. Um, came to States in 2005, and work with actually as a kind of an interesting side note with original cowgirls cheesemaker from Smith. He was a, a cheesemaker from Netherlands and he really kind of inspired um, me to get more interested in cheesemaking. And that's kind of how I fell in love with passion of making cheese, which is 
which is a, uh, people say it's a combination of art and science. There is art to it, but there is also a lot of science, more science than art, I would say, um, just because you want to make sure that you perfect those cheeses. So um, yeah, and I've been with Point Race for 15 years, um, started with Original Blue. I took over that recipe in 2009, um, do some slight modifications and in 2010, we started introducing new cheeses, and um, right now we have a five core products, um, and one of the products is Toma, which has a additional three flavors. Um, and today we will be trying uh, Toma truffle, um, as well as uh, traditional uh, Dutch Gouda, which is aged for at least 12 months. Um, we have a bloomy rind, uh, soft ripened, um, wrapped in spruce bark, um, Quinta, and um, and we're going to finish it up with Bay Blue. And I think we have a video of uh, what Point Reyes cheese looks like, or at least the dairy and cheese making operation. Well, you, you uh, definitely, you definitely, get, definitely get, the, get the prize for the most clever name of a robotic cheese turner, Tina Turner, if anybody missed that. It's very cute. Is is that what they play? Do they play Tina Turner songs? Well, uh, we don't play much Tina Turner with her, and but she, nevertheless, she is our one of our uh, most reliable employees who never missed a day at work. Um, <laughs> she works 24-7. She does need a little bit of TLC every once in a while, but you know, um, she doesn't even need the light to work. So um, yeah, it's, it, she's been great. <laughs> All right, Janet. Well, I would like to, at this point, introduce our, um, our other guest, Remy Cohen from Domain Carneros. Um, Remy is, uh, has a master's in viticulture, and I think she's probably one of the only, uh, one of the few people in, uh, the California winemaking who not only has a master's in viticulture, but has an MBA as well. So she is really, um, has, I'm sure Domin Canaris was thrilled to get her. She's only the second CEO in the company's um, history and she's the second female CEO. So this is a very, I think, um, a company that really uh, values women in leadership. And I know they value sustainability and that's an important thing that Remy, Remy will talk to us about. Um, so Remy, thank you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to, to bubbles. <laughs> thank you, Janet. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, you touched on a few of our tenets and values at Domain Carneros, but a little bit of history. We were founded in 1987 by the Tattinger family, the legendary Champagne family behind Champagne Tattinger. Um, and at the time they hired Eileen Crane, one of the first women winemakers in, um, in, in California um, to helm the operation, which is really amazing. Um, I'm gonna give a special shout out to one of the attendees tonight, which is Zach Miller. He is our current sparkling winemaker and also a huge fan of Janet and Laura and she's a clock um, and he's watching with his family tonight. So if we have any really technical winemaking questions, uh, Zach, our sparkling winemakers with us. Um, 
we are what you call a grower producer. You mentioned that I have a master's in viticulture. So that's something that's really valued to me, valuable to me is that we farm our own land. Um, so we have six different estates all in the Carneros region. We farm about 400 acres of mostly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which are two of the great varieties that go into making sparkling wine and making champagne and champagne. Um, the Carneros is in the southern end of Napa and Sonoma counties. It's the only wine region that spans both counties. It's cooler climate, so it's great for those cooler climate varieties. Um, and as Janet mentioned, we've been women led since our inception and we also focus on sustainability. So we are a solar powered winery. We have um, solar energy, but also a microgrid. So we can work um, off of our own solar energy in the case of a power outage, or also use our own solar energy in the evenings or night through battery storage. Um, we also collect all the rainfall on our property and use that for vineyard irrigation and recycle all the water that we use in the winemaking process. So um, some of our valuable things that we have. And tonight, um, I have two special wines for you. Not only our delicious 2019 Brut Sparkling, um, but our 2021 Estate Pinot Noir. And um, I might be biased, but sparkling wine and Pinot Noir, I believe, and others might concur, are two of the most versatile wines for food pairing. Um, so I think it's going to be really exciting to go back and forth with Cuba and have us all play around with the different pairings where we can try both of the wines with all of the cheeses. You want to cue up that video? Oh, yeah, let's do it. When Claude Tankinger came to building Domaine Carneros, the Carneros had the perfect climate and the right terroir as well. The breeze that comes all the way from the Pacific and comes through the Petaluma Wind Gap is really critical for cooling off the grapes at night. And this helps to preserve the acidity, which is a really critical component for both the sparkling and the still wines. One of the hallmarks of a finely made bottle of traditional method sparkling wine is the fine bead of bubbles. This is a more labor intensive way of making sparkling wine, but it is a quality stamp and one that we believe in. One of the main principles we have focused on is the use of renewable energy. In 2003, we built one of the largest solar arrays of any winery in the world. And right now, we are expanding on our commitment to solar energy by building a microgrid we use those guiding principles to lead everything we do moving forward. There is a lot of dynamic energy here at Domain Carneros, all of which builds upon our foundation of creating memorable sparkling wine experiences. Yeah, it is really a splendid spot. I recommend it to a lot of people when they say, where should I go tasting in Napa Valley? I say, well, you have to start at Domain Carneros. It's just uh, so beautiful to be sitting out on your terrace. Um, and, and drinking bubbles. But let's, uh, you brought more than bubbles today, but would you would you just walk us through the two wines that you brought, the sparkling wine and the Pinot Noir, so we can get familiar with them before we move to the cheese? Yes, yeah, so I know some of you um, are tasting along with us. This is the first wine, is our 2019 Estate Brut. This is a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from our estate vineyards. Um, we use, as the video showed, a process called the traditional method, method traditionnel, which is um, that every fermentation, the second fermentation occurs within the individual bottle, um, which is really special and it's a hallmark of quality and it creates the complexity, the yeastiness and the toastiness that we're used to um, in fine sparkling wines from around the world. So this is a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It goes through the secondary fermentation in the bottle, and then it ages for a minimum of three years, which is the rules in champagne for vintage dated wine. It's not something that in the US we're required to do, but we do believe that it um, adds to complexity in the wine. And so I think as we're talking in the context of cheese pairing, there's a couple of things that make sparkling wine and particularly this estate brute so versatile for pairing with cheese. One was called out by our Pinot Noir winemaker TJ in the video, which is the acidity. So the retention of the acidity from being grown in the cool climate of Carneros really makes this wine very versatile in terms of cheese pairing. And the acidity really can like cut the richness of a variety of cheeses. Um, and then the second wine is our 2021 Pinot Noir. Um, TJ likes to say that this wine is a mosaic of the Carneros region. We take um, different 
components of um, our wines from all six of our vineyards throughout the Napa and Carneros region to create this mosaic of the Carneros. Um, and this wine similarly has the beautiful freshness and acidity that you have and you expect from the Carneros region, but very different than the citrus notes of the um, of the of the brute and the kind of creamy complexity from the extended aging. You've got a lot of beautiful berry fruit um, and a little bit of earth tones. So it will be really interesting, I think, as we go through the different cheese tasting to compare and contrast um, the pairings. But I have a feeling that we're going to have a lot of fans of pairing both of these wines with all of these cheeses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I love about bubbles so much with cheese is, this, is that they really scrub your palate. I mean, mm -hmm. cheese is fat. <laughs> we have to acknowledge that. It, it, it just coats your tongue and the, the bubbles and the high acidity really help to kind of clean up your, your tongue and get you ready for the next bite. So it's certainly my go-to uh, wine for, for cheese. If I could only have one wine, it would be bubbles. But I, I know that Pinot is going to be a great, um, a great match as well. Before we get into cheese, I just want to remind everybody about the Q&A. Uh, to please give us your questions. And I also want to remind you that this is being recorded. So, and it will very quickly go onto my website, archive, video archive, and Laura's. And I think Point Rays will post it as well. So if you have uh, friends who want to listen to this later, you'll still be able to purchase the cheese collection from Point Rays for a little while longer, the cheese o'clock collection. You'll still be able to purchase these two wines from uh, Domain Carneras as a set. So what a nice holiday gift to give this, um, these cheeses and wines, plus the donation to World Central Kitchen, which um, Point Reyes will make, and, um, and they can watch the video along with it and have um, cheese o'clock on their own. So with that, um, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started yeah. with the cheese. I have so much to say about the wine and cheese pairing, but I know everybody wants to get into the pairing itself. So let's do that. Um, so uh, our first cheese, uh, Cuba, is your truffle Toma, Toma mm -hmm. truffle, excuse me. And um, so I think for anybody um, that didn't know there was truffles in it, all they would have to do is lift it up in the underside, especially it's just captured all of that truffle. I feel like I'm walking through a field in Italy here. Uh, so tell us about this cheese. So. Um... Yeah, Toma truffle is actually made on a, our original um, regular Toma, which is um, considered American original. Um, it's And what that means is that it doesn't follow um, any known recipes uh, from anywhere in the world. We um, it's It uses some combinations of, uh, of tricks and methods of making cheeses uh, in from, I would call it from the old world of uh, Europe. Um, so it is a combination of Gouda and Havarti, what makes this cheese a little bit more unique. Um, and um, we introduced Toma in 2010 to the market, and it has this nice, rich, buttery flavor um, with nice uh, grassy tang finish at the end. And um, in 2019, right before pandemic, we, we were approached by the customer to... Um, to make special cheese for them. And we started experimenting with flavors. We didn't want to do flavors in the past, um, but we were like, okay, we're going to do this one-off. And uh, the summer before 2019, the Giacomini family, they went to Italy for vacation and they happened to go to Sabatino uh, family who, um, who grows uh, truffles. And they said, to Sabatino family that if they if we ever make cheese with truffle, we're only gonna use your guys' as truffles. So, mm -hmm. you know, fast forward a year later, uh, we were not gonna ever make uh, flavored cheeses, but then we decided, okay, let's go for it. So we naturally had to try uh, make truffle toma. And um, the thing about truffle is, is that they're very oily. So, um, it's it's hard to mix sometimes oil and oil, which is you know fats from milk and then uh, uh, and the, from the truffle. So truffles can be tricky that way as well. And but because of that, um, it altered a little bit of the original texture of toma. Toma normally is it's more elastic. It's not as creamy. Toma truffle is going to be the creamiest uh, out of all four tomas we have in our line, just because of the little bit of extra fat which comes from the truffles. And um, 
what the fat does is retain a little bit of a moisture. So the texture is really creamy. It will, really will melt in your mouth. Um, so it is a washed curd cheese. Uh, and what that means is that during the process of cheese making, we will remove portion of the whey and we'll wash it with hot water to remove um, available lactose for lactic acid bacteria to convert it uh, into acid. So we are able to keep the pH or acidity of the cheese a little higher. Uh, and that would make the cheese more elastic, more soft and um, pliable. It actually has a uh, PA range of um, pasta filata, which makes it for very good um, uh, meltable cheese. So, so you can very easily you know, grate it on a uh, on potatoes, or you can um, subsidize um, toma truffle for uh, mozzarella on a pizza, for instance. Yeah, you know, a couple of things about this cheese. What I love about it is that, uh, and there are a lot of truffle cheeses. I really don't like the truffle is just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I like this cheese because you can still taste the toma underneath yeah. it. You still get that butter, the that warm butter flavor of um, plain toma under the truffles. Uh, the other thing which you touched on is that this is just a great cooking cheese. Yeah. In fact, I probably cook with it more than I just eat it straight. It is um, wonderful on polenta. You know, you've made your polenta and you put it out on your board and you just slice some toma truffle on top and it will melt. And it's like a really, you know, inexpensive way to get your truffle yeah. hit. Um, but I use it in grilled cheese, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches. Laura's group, the grilled cheese queen, but uh, you probably use Toma truffle and grilled cheese, Laura, I would bet. <laughs> yeah. Yes, definitely. And actually toasted cheese, because to me, this cheese tastes like when you have um, when you have tr actual truffle shaved on a pasta that's made with butter. This is what that's what this tastes like to me. Also, it makes a difference. I am shaving this cheese using this. And it really, it melts on my tongue much better than if I'm cutting it into pieces. And it's also not, I mean, the, the truffle flavor comes through, but it's not overwhelming, which for me is a deal killer when it comes to cheeses. You alluded to that, Janet, that if it's too, if it's too strong, it's too strong, if there's too much truffle. And this is really, um, like I say, this is kind of like butter and truffle. Um, one thing that might be a little bit surprising to people is that when you look at this cheese, it, you don't really see the truffle. You see a couple of little flecks of mm. truffle in it, but it's, and I mean, I can see some here, but generally, you know, obviously a little bit must go a long way because it's infusing all of the cheese, but the, you don't actually see a lot of it. And that might be the oils you're referring to, Kuma. Yeah, so um, so so Sabatino family actually makes for us a, a specific um, um, zest um, uh, of truffle which is uh, which has combination it's got a little bit of oil in it as well um so uh, the 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 pieces like you mentioned if you look at the pace of the cheese you will see smaller speckles of truffles we didn't want to have um big chunks and that was done on purpose because the bigger the chunk can also cause some defects in the paste of the cheese by having too much oils around and having a white blotchy spots um, so we didn't want to have that neither. So, so they, they really, uh, we've worked together with Sabatino family to, to really get that zest dial in to, to meet our requirements for cheese making. And, and you're right, we, our batches are thousand gallons. Uh, we do thousand gallon vats, which is about, um, thousand, uh, pounds of cheese. Um, and we put in a very small fraction of, uh, of travels. When, when I did research, um, when we started making um, flavors, we did experiments and um, we, like Janet, you mentioned that we want to make sure that we didn't want to hide and overpower the Toma. The whole goal was to make sure that the Toma still is, a, is the queen of the show and then the truffle is just, you know, enhances the, uh, and brings the flavors, um, more robust flavors to, to the Toma. So we want to still make sure that Toma is a star. Um, Remy, what do you um what where where did you go wine wise did you have a preference with what well I, I wondered whether Remy had a wine preference oh yeah the sparkling wine in the um pinot well I really love the um how the sparkling wine complements the creamy butteriness and like the light nutty notes of the toma as far as like the base cheese 
Um, and so I think if we were having the straight Toma, it would hands down that the sparkling would be the winner. Um, but given the subtle truffle flavor, which is uh, truffles and mushrooms and earth tone foods are often a really great pairing for Pinot Noir. So I think that you could really go either way. I'm curious to hear too from um, all the all the guests what their favorite is. Um, I generally drink a lot of sparkling, so <laughs> I'm slightly on that preference, but I think that given that little um, bit of that subtle truffle notes that it really does highlight well with the Pinot Noir as well. What did you think? I actually think that the um, sparkling wine enhances the flavors of truffle. It's like mm -hmm. the effervescence of it brings a um, little bit more um, flavorful note of truffle to the upfront a little bit. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, because the base cheese, as you said, Remy, um, the base Toma without the truffle would definitely be, um, I think the one I would choose with the sparkling wine. I'm actually choosing it with the sparkling wine for the same reason now. It sort of cuts the richness, but the butteriness of the cheese uh, somehow finds its way really nicely with the sparkling wine. I feel like with the Pinot, I lose a little bit of the fruit in the wine, but it also brings out an earthiness that I do like. So it's kind of, we're, we're, you know, we're splitting hairs here. Both are great. <laughs> well, let's move on to our next cheese, which yeah. is um, the newest one in Point Reyes' um, lineup. And Quinta, Quinta is the name. It's the one with the, the bay leaf on top. And I know um, Kuba will give us some history of this cheese, so I won't bother. But uh, I will, I want to show you how to get into it. If you haven't already dug into your Quinta, this is a an unusual style of cheese and you don't just try to cut it into wedges like you might a brief. One thing that's got this bark of you know, spruce bark on the outside, you're gonna have a really tough time trying to cut it. So the traditional way to do it is to cut across the top and fold back um, the top. And let's see if I can do it. This is kind of an awkward angle, but I just got a little paring knife and I'm gonna go around the top and I'm just going to go about halfway and then I'm going to fold it back. And so you can get into it. You see, oh, the, I think the, it's having a hard time with the uh, focusing on the light, but I've just folded back a half of it. And now it's really soft and um, just supple underneath. And you can scoop it out with a spoon uh, or a butter knife and spread it on a piece of bread or a cracker. If you don't eat the whole thing, then you can just fold back your half, put it in a, a, a Tupperware and, and there you go. But uh, that's the traditional way. If you know you're gonna eat the whole thing, just go ahead and slice off that whole top and, and remove it and let your guests just dig in. So my guess is my guess is there are some people out there, Jan, that saying, you mean you don't eat the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> I do not by myself, but um, Kuba, tell us about how this cheese came to, tell us what the name means, because I know it does have some special mm. meaning, and then tell us, um, what are the challenges of making a cheese like this? So, um, so I've had this, so I'll go back, way back, it's just going back to like 2009, 2010, um, Giacomini family, um, Dean Giacomini, who was uh, Bob Giacomini's wife, who's uh, the president of the company, um, she always loved soft ripened cheeses, and um, and you know we we never really got to it. You know, unfortunately, she passed away before um, before we were able to to make this cheese. And um, she's um, you know it was something which we want to make it um, to add to our um, production line as well as to um fulfill Dean's dream but um we were um so it took many years obviously before I got to that project because we got busy with other cheeses and 2020 was coming up and we were having our 20th anniversary which got shut down by COVID um but in the meantime I was already working on developing the cheese I I really was it was completely outside of my wheelhouse um, it's totally different style than what I was used to. It's very tricky cheese to make, um, especially to make it right where it's it's spoonable and it has a great flavors. It doesn't have too much ammonia. Um, and 
and ripens properly, so it doesn't have many defects. Um, so quinta in Portuguese um, means um, estate, but also, and that was more tribute to um, to to um, to the girl's mom, Dean, um, who was from Portugal, um, you know, to 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 give back to her heritage. And then also we have um, a lot of our employees are from Spain, uh, from Mexico, so the Hispanic. And in uh, Quinta, in Hispanic means means fifth. So this is our fifth kind of a core line cheese we've made. We have original blue, we have a bay blue, we have a Gouda, Toma, and a Quinta was the last one, it was the fifth. Um, so um, this cheese had a lot of challenges. It took me a good year and a half um, of figuring out how to make it. And I was towards, the, when I figured out how to make it, I, I kind of sat down, I remember sitting down in my office, I was like, how come I did not think about this right away? It was so obvious, it was right in front of me. And I just couldn't see the, how to make this sooner, but um, it was very complex. We've also um, ran into some challenges during COVID. Um, we started producing, we released it to distribution and then uh, we hit the supplies issues of the bark and we could not get the bark for several months. I think we we're out of the market for about six to eight months, I believe, or maybe even a little longer, uh, just because we couldn't get the bark, uh, which was the important part of this cheese because this cheese is so soft that it will, if you don't have it wrapped uh, with the spruce bark, it will fall apart. And the bark we um, we purchased, we, we're purchasing from France. So not only... COVID was uh, delayed everything, but you know the shipping channels and all all the other aspects of this um, made it more difficult. So, so it was a little bit of a problematic child for a while. But now, you know, we we moved on. We uh, now we have a full product and um, we're happy with it. It's um, we're making two sizes. This is the the ones we offer today. Was the ten ounce. We also made a smaller version with just five ounce. Um, they do age a little differently when I'm gonna focus on 10 answer. It's the cheese is, um, it's aged. It only, the shelf is about hundred days from the day we make it. Uh, we recommend consuming it from day 30 on. Between 30 and 50 day, this cheese is young. It's got a fresh um, buttery, milky flavor. It's very, it can be a little lactic. Um, and it have, but it has still have a nice sweet notes of milk. And then from 50 on, it started becoming a little bit more savory. It gets um, some herbaceous notes of um, which comes from bark, which the bark also is infused with um, some of the bay leaves, um, um, which comes actually from our farm. And that's also why we put the bay leaf on top of the, the wheel, just to um, bring a little bit of our farm to, to that cheese and uh, have it our own terroir of this unique product and um to your point also what you said earlier about that you can you eat the whole thing yes you can except the bark um <laughs> but you will get a lot of you know and i personally enjoy the rind uh when the cheese is under 50 days it's it's a little bit softer it's not it's, it's not quite as crusty yet um, it will have a flavor of like a wild or like a white button mushroom. Um, and it can be um, very lovely as well. Um, as the cheese ages out, the um, unfortunately penicillium um, is known to produce a little bit of ammonia. So you might get start getting a little bit more defects. But um, but when it's when the rind is young, it's it's very pleasant to eat as well. You know, and I want to point out, if you didn't notice, um, your, your wheel had a date stamp on it on the mm -hmm. uh, rind it says when it's I mean yeah on the outside it says when it's made and yeah. uh sort of enjoy by kind of a mm -hmm. you know, use by date so you can judge how mature your cheese is by that day the ours was mine was made on um, November 5th so almost a 60 day old piece of cheese I know it could go another 30 days it's and I would still love it it's going to get more supple it's going to get more almost kind of mustardy kind of yeah. uh, flavor. I already, already get a little bit of that, but I love the way that spruce bark gives it a really woodsy, uh, you know, just that woodsy note uh, that makes yeah. me think of kind of leaf litter. And uh, it's a really, to me, this is a, a fall cheese, a, kind of a holiday 
cold weather cheese. And um, now is the perfect time to enjoy it. Yeah, so it certainly was made in style of the Vacheron Mondor, which is the French um, cheese, which is made in French and Swiss Alps uh, during the winter months. So when the milk is re rich and then full of fat. So um, um, yeah, so that that's the, certainly was um, the style we were aiming for. However, I will say that our cheese is much milder than Vacheron Mondor. Vacheron Mondor is very can be very pungent, little, has a little bit of bee linens. If anybody's familiar, you can have a little bit of a, um, would I say, have, Laura, help me out with what? Yeah, I was going to say, bee linens, I think um, in the vernacular, we call those stinky cheeses. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, they're bacteria, but they um, but they lend a little bit of orange color to it and a little bit of that aromatic quality that some people just go crazy for and some people are like, no, but um but, you know, the, the cheese, my cheese, my quinta, and, you know, we all probably have cheese from, from similar batches, if not the same, but they are going to present differently to each of us for different reasons. And um, I am finding a lot of mustardy characteristics in mine. I very often feel this cheese is kind of a little bit like, because that woodsiness, a little bit like a hot dog and mustard together. And, um, and uh, you just need the bun. And so uh, I'm getting a little bit of that today or tonight, which makes it um, sometimes a challenge for wine pairing. Although I have a, I have my favorite uh, among these two. So Remy, enter in here. What do you think? Well, I think similarly to the last one, it's dealer's choice. Both of the pairings are very lovely. This cheese is outstanding. And um I think if it didn't have the, and similar to the truffle and the toma, if this cheese didn't have the bay laurel, um, that I would have been even more inclined to go for the sparkling wine, which I think pairs really well with it. Um, similar to what Kuba was saying in terms of the bubbles lifting the truffle flavor, I get that with the herbal notes of the quinta and the, the bay leaf um, and bark which I really like. And I think it highlights the zestiness of the sparkling wine. And then obviously the creaminess of the sparkling wine pairs really well with the creaminess of the cheese. I just love a cheese that oozes. Um, just needed to throw that in there. However, um, with the Bay Laurel, I think that brings out something really special in our Pinot Noir, which is um, the, the herbal and non-fruit notes of our Pinot Noir. And I think that's a hallmark of a serious Pinot Noir, especially in California, when Pinot Noir can tend to be very fruity and that um, a lot of California Pinot Noirs, because of all of our beautiful sunshine here, um, the, the fruit character characteristics tend to dominate. And while our Pinot Noir does have a lot of the classic um, berry and cherry notes that you want in a Pinot Noir, it also has a fair amount of non-fruited character like earth, earth notes and spice notes. And I think that the Quinta plays really well with that in terms of how the, the Bay Laurel highlights the herbal notes in the Pinot Noir. Yeah, yeah. the Pinot get, definitely gets my vote on this one. Mine as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, have, I have to say, I, I did a little experiment and I tasted a little bit closer as you were talking about those notes, ambrosia notes and earthy notes. I tried it closer to the bark and I really enjoyed with Pinot. And that's where the flavors of woodsiness are even a little stronger in that abracious flavors from the Bay Laurel. And I tried a little closer to the middle with the sparkling. I actually enjoy more because of that buttery, um, buttery flavor. So it, it can be, you know, you can split your votes both ways and say that, you know, both wines actually work well with, with the cheese. Just de depends uh, which part of cheese, cheese you're going to try. That's so cool. It's like two cheeses in one and two wines. So which is why cheese and wine pairing is so darn hard because, because somebody might get this bite and you say, oh my gosh, you know, this cheese and the Pinot are so amazing. And they're like, mm, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> and then you get to that part of the cheese and you try it with the Pinot and all of a sudden, oh yeah, I get it. So um, cheese and wine pairing is very subjective. And a lot of it has to do with with where you are tasting the cheese closer to the rind or not. And also the wines, the temperature. Um, and also, you know, Remy, I poured, I deliberately poured the sparkling wine into a white wine glass, not a champagne flute, because I wanted to release more of the aromas. And, um, and I just sort of prefer drinking it out of this, but I know it's a, you know, it can, it's a bit of, well, I don't know if it's controversial, but I know that some people think this is like, not okay. And, 
some people think that um, flutes are no longer okay. So where, how do you enter in on this? Well, in general, at Domain Carneros, we want people to just drink bubbles however they want to. Um, so we don't want to overcomplicate things um, for, for people. Um, but I do wholeheartedly support the white wine, kind of an all-purpose glass. I think that that's usually my go-to at home. Um, I think that it does kind of elevate the aromatic experience. Um, but flutes are fun as well and kind of festive and they're a unique glass for bubbly. So, um, I have no, no, no nothing against the flute, um, at the winery, we often use, um, the tulip glass, which is kind of the best of both worlds where you've got a little bit of a wider, um, middle and then narrows, and that kind of channels the aromatics into your, um, palate when you're smelling the wine. Um, and also gives a little bit of, you know, wider, um, a, a, like a wider surface area to release the aromatics into, into the wine. So I really think it's up to you. Even a coupe is fun and festive. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're, we're not judgmental here and we want people to just drink bubbles and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Laura, you want to get us going on the next cheese? The, yeah. Would you like to introduce our next cheese? <laughs> that I can do. And um, and, and what I, what I was going to say about it is that first of all, it's absolutely, well, how can I say it's one of my favorites from Point Reyes since I kind of, am, that's not a limited, um, list, but, um, but it really is. And, uh, I think it's a cheese that probably wouldn't have been part of the, um, selection of cheeses made at Point Reyes were it not for you, Cuba. And I don't know if you had a background in making this cheese or you just loved it, or you just thought, oh, this would be a good cheese for us to make. I'm not sure the origins of this Gouda, but all I know is that I'm really glad you you did it. So um, yeah, Gouda was a, a little bit of a, I wouldn't say not a mistake, but um, it was one of those cheeses which, when, so the full story is, let me back up. <laughs> I, we I only got, have a little while now just so I you know, know i came in 2009 to point race and there's only original blue the girl the girls three, three sisters um a four sister actually at the time um wanted to introduce new cheeses and the previous cheese maker really was focusing on blue cheese he did all that's all he wanted to do so when i came on board the girls were like well can we make something else so i started experimenting with the cheeses and that's how Toma was created. And during that same time, I was experimenting with the Alpine style cheeses, some farmhouse style. Um, and one of them was traditional Dutch Gouda. And that was kind of more uh, going a little bit to uh, what I was taught through Fawn Smith, who I mentioned earlier. He is a Dutch cheese maker. So, um, so I decided I'm going to try it. And so we made some first batches in 2010. Uh, along with other products and believe it or not we the, the wheels got a little bit mixed up and we lost them for about a year and a half to two years wow and um and one day we we're we we're doing upgrading in the, our brining room slash aging room at the time and we found some extra wheels, so we started tasting them and we were like oh my god this is really good it has those nice um crystal notes you know it um it had the color was like butterscotch it has a sweetness caramelly sweet flavors with some nutty not nuts and hazelnuts um so we just decided well my god we gotta start making this so to this day we make this product in a very small volume we only produce about 200 wheels a month mm -hmm. um, and to give you a contrast we produce about six thousand wheels of toma every month so so it's a very small production. We make them in the 20 pound wheels um, because the Gudas do age best in about 20 pound wheel. Um, it's a perfect ratio of um, losing moisture throughout the throughout the aging process. And we, we do age it for about 12 to 14 months right now. Um, and um, as you see the cheese it will have some white speckle those are tyrosine crystals um usually happens uh, in a third after about nine months um of aging as the cheese is losing moisture however it's what's unique about our gouda is that it still retain the creamy flavors and the creamy texture it's not that dry brittle uh old amsterdamer <laughs> you know you get in the store which is all crackly and has an um, over overly crystallized 
um, it has it, it's 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 really well balanced. So, and I think that's what makes this cheese very unique to um, really eat almost on its own. Like I personally don't like to pair it with any anything like food wise. Like I like to have it on its own with a glass of wine because because of that sweetness it has. It's very it's very rich. Yeah, very but you rich. know what I like about it compared to you know some of these Dutch goudas that we get that are so old. Mm -hmm. They are so. Um, you have one bite of those, and it's that first bite's very pleasing. They're like butterscotch candy, but that's mm -hmm. all you want. You know, you can't eat any more of them. They're so yeah. dense and concentrated yeah. and super sweet. Your cheese, you can just keep eating and eating and eating. It's got that gorgeous creaminess, and I always get kind of a, a pineapple note out of it, or sort of mm -hmm. a roasted pineapple note on top of that caramel note. Yeah. It's just the texture is fabulous. The aroma is so compelling, and it's just I can't stop eating it kind of cheese. <laughs> and and even though you said that you like it just on its own, um, Kuba, I actually what I like about it also is that is the texture because it will melt. And yeah. uh, unlike a lot of the goodas that you're referring to that are more aged and just harder cheeses, it will melt. And um, I have not a problem with that. <laughs> and again, you know, in a, in its melted form, uh, but simply, you know, it can. It'll, it'll, I feel like it can be overwhelmed easily too, if it, once it's melted, but I think it's great melted or, um, but it's great like this as well. It's, and it's perfect on a cheese board because it really holds its own. And, it, and as Janet said, it's something you can just keep eating uh, and which is good news, bad news. So how about with the wines? Well, you can probably tell I'm um, not going to pick my favorite child in this uh, <laughs> conversation tonight, um, and, but instead choose to highlight um, what I think is the best of, of each pairing. Um, so I feel like with the um, sparkling wine, it's a really fun textural experience. Um, not only do you have the interplay of the crystals, but you have that with the mousse or the bubbles of the sparkling wine. And that is, you know, just really fun and lovely. Um, but I do also think the Pinot Noir is a great pairing and it seems like um, others on the chat are agreeing in the sense that it really, the aged um, Gouda has a little bit more robustness than some of the other cheeses that we've had. And so having the tannin and the structure in the Pinot Noir is a nice interplay with the aged Gouda. And also I feel like um, Kuba touched a little bit on the sweetness of the Gouda. And for me, that's really highlighting some of the wild berry and like wild strawberry notes in the Pinot Noir. And I really love that. I totally agree with everything you just said and not just because you're you. Uh, <laughs> it was, I totally agree. The one thing I wanted to point out is that as my sparkling, well, as both wines, but the sparkling wine, as it, as it gets a little bit warmer, that toasty quality really, um, really comes to the fore, which I really like. And, um, I don't know if everybody does, but I do. But still, the wine is retaining its acidity and every and all of its other components. But I just noticed that um, a little bit more. And so I feel like I'm having cheese and bread and it's wonderful. You know, I know uh, what I couldn't help thinking about as I tasted it with these two wines is that I know, uh, Remy, you also make an, a wine that has more residual sugar, a sparkling mm -hmm. wine, uh, forgetting the name of it. But I, I think Perfect. that that's where I would go. I want a little more... Um, sweetness in the sparkling wine. So I want something that's not quite so austere with this Gouda. What, what is the sparkling wine you make that's got some more residual sugar? It's interesting. Um, it's called Vermeil. Um, and it's our brute base with a touch more um, sugar from the dosage. And we also use La Rev, which is our Tete de Cuvée, 100% Blanc de Blanc from our favorite vineyard as the base for the um, dosage liqueur. Um, so it, verme is a technique that means um, gold on silver. And so that's the idea of putting the, the gold of the La Rev on the, um, on the brute as a little special touch for the sweetness. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was going to actually mention it with the next cheese um, to fast forward. And I think, but to your point, the more robust the cheese, if you're going with a sparkling wine, it can handle a little bit more sweetness, which is why a lot of people think sparkling wine, especially those that have a little bit more residual sugar pairs really well with robust foods and spicy foods. And I think similarly with the cheeses, um, it pairs well with more robust cheese. And I had 
a major epiphany with blue cheese and this blue cheese in particular with our sparkling wine. So stay tuned. <laughs> well, thank Kuba, you for Kuba. that segue. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, Kuba, there was a, there is a question. Um, people would like to know what is on the outside of the Gouda. So, um, so the Gouda is covered with uh, cheese coating. It's a special coating, which is, uh, it's a clear coating, which allows us to preserve the rind as well as control the oxygen exchange and moisture loss uh, from the cheese. Um, the one other thing I would mention, going back to like sometimes those old uh, Dutch uh, Goudas, which are aged for over two years and they're very dry. If you look at the, the bottom of the rind, um, you will often see like a darker, almost like a grayish looking discoloration. This is because it's oxidation and uh, it will have it will have very unpleasant um, flavor. It, it will uh, absolutely destroy the experience of that nice sweet flavors. It will be kind of musty. Um, so the cheese coating prevents from this to happen. So, so if you uh, maintaining that rind, uh, by putting the cheese coating on a regular basis allows us to uh, to keep the entire paste uh, fully intact. It is it is a plastic polymer. It is a it's a food grade. Um, it if you eat it, it will, you'll be fine. But it is you can you can see you can if you peel it you can you can when it warms up especially you can peel it off and it's it's just a little bit of a it's a just co cheese coating. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So well, let's move on to our final cheese, which uh, Remy alluded to. It's one of the two blue cheeses that they make at Point Reyes and the second one that they created. And I, it's always been uh, just a favorite of mine. It's it's kind of, if you're familiar with Stilton, it, it may remind you of Stilton. It's more buttery, more nutty, more mellow than their original blue. And it's got a rind on it, a little bit of a rind. And um, I just, uh, think it's a fabulous place to end. So Kuba, would you tell us a little bit about Bay Blue, how you make it and how we should think about it when we're tasting it? Yeah, so um, so Bay Blue, we, it's, it's a cheese which I actually didn't wanna make and I made it uh, against my own will. Um, nobody forced <laughs> me to do it. Um, <laughs> just because when I started working for Point Reyes, I really had no experience with blue cheeses and I never realized I, I didn't realize up until, you know, first few days of working here, um, how difficult blue cheeses can be and how tricky they are. Um, and so it took me about eight months to kind of refine the original blue recipe. And after that, I told myself it was a very stressful first eight months of my employment here. I was like, you know what? I'm never making another blue cheese ever again because it's just, it's just not worth it. You know, there's a reason why I don't have hair anymore. You know, I lost it because of the blue cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, jokes aside, um, one day I decided that original blue is made in such a complex way that I was thinking about it. It was like, you know what, there is a much simpler way of making blue cheese. It doesn't have to be so complicated. And um, so that's how the Bay Blue started. And the idea behind the Bay Blue was to make it not being this classic blue cheese just like original blue is original blue is very classic pungent sweet milky notes up front very buttery texture almost spoonable and um and a pungent kind of a um, finish where bay blue it's more like a, a little bit of a chameleon you know it depends where you try it it can taste differently and the unique thing about the blue cheeses is that they are aging from inside to the outside as opposed to bloomy rind cheeses, which age from outside to the inside. Um, so, so if you if you look at the wedge of cheese and you taste the tip of the cheese, which is the middle of it, you will have more sweet notes. Um, it will have a little bit more blue cheese characteristics. If you move closer to the rind, you will start getting a little more sa savory umami flavors um, with a little bit slight higher hints of salt. Um, and the reason the salt is a little bit more pronounced towards the rind is because um, because we hand salt every wheel instead of a brining. So um, so salt absorption is a little bit less controllable for us. Um, but uh, I would say the age difference between the, the, the middle of the cheese and the rind is about two weeks in flavor. So I personally really enjoy Bay Blue when it's at about 45 days um, in the middle of the cheese. 
So if I know I'm eating 60 day old cheese, I'm eating closer to the right. Interesting. It's so, um, I was going to point out that they really do just like the Quinta really do taste like two different cheeses, uh, much more savory toward the rind. And um, as you said, sweeter toward the center and texturally, they're very different too. You know, mm -hmm. you've got the creamier and then you've got the a little bit more firm toward yeah. the rind, which all makes sense, but it really is uh, interesting in terms of not only the flavor and the textural sensations, but also when you, when it comes to pairing. So Remy, what do you, what do you think since you love this cheese? I do love this cheese. It's uh it's just incredible. Um, so much balance and subtlety with complexity at the same time. Um, and well, the good news, you queued it up for me. Both the wines are great with this cheese um, and maybe a little bit um, more if you have the center with the sparkling wine, which enhances the creaminess um, and a little bit of the sweetness. And I think what we were starting to talk about um, with, with Janet was the, the level of dosage or the level of sweetness in the wines. And we um, make our brute with a range of sweetness. So we make a wine called the Ultra Brute, which would pair well with kind of um, less aged cheeses like, um, and also like softer, like whiter cheeses. I don't know all the technical terms like you guys do, but like a goat cheese or like a, a younger triple, triple cream cheese. And then we've got our estate brute, which is um, what we're having. And it's sort of the Goldilocks. And I think it's done really good job, like um, going the distance in this tasting. It pairs well with all of these wines, uh, with all of these cheeses that the Vermeil, which is the wine with a little bit of extra sweetness is just an incredible wine with this Bay Blue. And I had an epiphany with that. Um, when I first started working here, um, I tended to not be that interested in demi sex or sweeter sparkling wines. And when I had our Vermeil with this um, Bay Blue was a complete my game changer for me. I love that pairing so much. And um, it really opened my mind to the purpose of the higher dosage levels and how well it pairs with Indian food or Thai food or spark, um, spicy foods, um, but also with more pungent um, foods as well as like this blue cheese. So really incredible. I think um, probably more classically though, the earthiness of the blue cheese pairs really well with the Pinot Noir in a, in a, in a more classic pairing. Yeah. You know, I typically, I'm not a fan of blue cheese with dry red wine, but this one works. I'm not sure why, except that the, the blue is pretty mellow and that Pinot you know, has just a lot of um, depth to it. So that's working for me. I think it's, that would be my choice between the two. I think oh. that, I think that what you just said, Janet, I think underscores why Pinot is such a cheese friendly wine, not just blue cheese or anything else, because there's, there's less to compete with. You know, cheese is a very complex, if it's good, it's a very complex thing. And if you're trying to, I think I think what you said is, and I feel the same way, if we were trying to pair a big Cabernet or something with this Bay Blue, I think it would be a disaster because that would just be two things really competing against each other and bringing out bitterness and all of these things. But this Pinot is just so balanced itself and this the tannins are soft. So you're not competing against those tannins in particular, those the 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 tannins being the drying and sometimes even bitter sensation that that one gets. So I think that um that's why, for me anyway, that's 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 what I'm telling myself that that's why this Pinot goes with this bay blue and also the the savoriness of this blue, relatively speaking. Other blues, including your original blue, Cuba, mm -hmm. has kind of a tanginess to it, a buttermilk characteristic to it and although i have successfully paired original blue with bigger red wines uh i think in the case of this more earthy style blue cheese the a pinot uh stands a chance <laughs> and or and more Before than we, uh, wind up our, our hour i i don't know if there are questions because i on my zoom screen, yeah let's see if there are any questions well i so um so remy um someone has a question for you wondering um, about your Pinot. Is it, or how is it more balanced than other California Pinots? Of course, that's a, that's an obviously biased question uh, on the part of, of this person, but, um, but it's a good one. Well, I like their bias. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but um, I think just in general, what um, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, um, the hallmarks of a, of a good quality Pinot Noir is one that has um, good acidity and also some non-fruit character. So those earth and spice tones. And I think this wine um, does a really great job of that. So I think it's, you know, a little bit earlier harvest so that you capture some of the herbal notes and the spice notes. Um, it's interplaying with the right amount of barrels in your um, barrel program, not too much new oak to overwhelm it, but just enough to highlight those um, earthy and um, spicy flavors. Okay. And the same person would like to know um, the best way to store leftover cheese from this tasting. What do you mean leftover? Okay. Yeah, just exactly. kidding. Uh, so Kuba, would you like to answer that? Yeah. So, um, so cheese, so in, let's take uh, blue cheese first. Uh, it's kind of like with wine. Oxygen is your friend and your enemy. So when you want to store the cheese, uh, especially blues, you want to, you want to, you want to minimize the amount of oxygen. The oxygen will continue to make the mold bloom. Therefore, the shelf life will be shorter. So um, ideally, uh, you know, aluminum foil, um, you know, wrap it really tightly. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be very successful with storing cheese for several weeks. Um, don't be alarmed if you have a little bit of a surface mold growth on it. It's just simply scrape it off and enjoy the rest of the cheese. Is it is after all is it is a blue cheese. Um, and what are you that, what are you putting it in in that case then? How are you I'm wrapping? Sorry? How are you wrapping it in in? To like do that? I, I would do aluminum foil. You know you can do saran wrap too. You know the tighter the tighter. <laughs> I know. I if you don't have if you don't have a really um, proper cheese paper um like we, we use aluminum with plastic layers um which is a special um plastic which allows us to control really not infusing any flavors it's all about controlling the oxygen um going into that product so um so so i'm not i didn't say surround and i'm gonna say aluminum foil tightly and then maybe putting that putting the ziploc bag too over it so then um eliminates more oxygen so um, i I sometimes will put this a cheese like this just at just on its own, but in a, a Tupperware type container. I haven't wrapped it. Mm -hmm. um, am I doing am I doing it wrong? No, I mean it's you, you don't want to dry. So as long as you have a small container which doesn't have too much oxygen and it doesn't dry the cheese out, then that's probably fine. But it's it's all about again like the amount of oxygen uh, present because not only will encourage the mold to bloom and cover the cheese with mold but also you're going to have some drying drying for uh problems so so that's why wrapping it is actually a you know if you wrap it and put it in tupperware probably that's going to be your best the best bet in my in my opinion um yeah uh, but keep that blue cheese separate from your other cheeses in my experience because that blue mold will travel yeah it yes. will travel quickly yes and you know and the the other the, the quinta it's you know if you I personally try not to leave Quinta for another sitting. Um, I feel like it, it, the Quinta is very sensitive to any dryness and any oxygen exposure. Uh, it will dry out, uh, creating a little bit of a crust, which is which is nothing wrong with it. It's just it just loses some of some of the creaminess. Um, so, you know, um, but. Uh, if you do need to store it, then like Janet recommended, putting the lid back on, um, putting the smaller Tupperware container, you know, hum keeping it humid, it's it's the key. Well, Is we it okay to, I, I, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, think gonna, I think we need to wrap up, but we would be happy to answer any questions that were on the question list or in the chat that didn't get answered, Laura, and I will personally answer them uh, via email. And we just want to, Thank all of you for joining us and especially thank our guests, um, Remy Cohen from Domain Carneris and Cooper Hemmerling from Point Race Farmstead Cheese. It's been such a pleasure to taste your products and taste them together. And we're so grateful for you two and for all of you who joined us on Cheese O'Clock uh, tonight. Laura, I'm sure you have a final word. Some parting words. Well, uh, yes. No, thank you for spending this time with us for, for on Cheese O'Clock. And uh, it's really fun, I think, for Janet and me to to come back with you and um, 
And yeah, you can find, once again, you can find uh, the recordings soon on both Janet's and my website so that you can repeat this fabulous experience. And I'm sure that uh, Janet and Cuba and all the folks at Point Raised Cheese and at Domaine Carneros would be happy to hear from you in any way. And of course, um, Domaine Carneros, if you're in the Napa Valley, please go visit because it's absolutely gorgeous. Never mind the great wines that they make there. And likewise, uh, you can make appointments at the Fork, uh, which is the culinary arm of Point Reyes Cheese and go visit there. And uh, otherwise you can find the cheeses and wines probably uh, wherever you buy cheese and wine. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Well, thank, thank you. you.